talking about exploiting the forest with trees. So, guys. <laughs> All right, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, in many ways, this is a follow on to a presentation I gave here five years ago that, or, that originally had to do with uh, using some ideas from linguistics to defeat SQL injection. But we've taken it quite a bit farther. So um, the fellow who said this, uh, Tony Hoare, um, you might have heard of an algorithm he wrote called Quicksort. Um, he was one of the fathers of computer science. Um, and this is from a paper that he wrote about uh, correctness proofs of, uh, of computer programs. However, things have changed pretty considerably between 1969 and today. When the, uh, in the early days of the internet, ARPANET, CSNET, et cetera, the biggest concern was, can we get these computers to talk to each other over long distances? Um, you're probably familiar, does everyone here know what Postel's Law is? Hands, come on, let's do some, good. Less than half the audience knows what Postel's Law is. Okay, those of you who know what it is, forget it. Um, in the 70s, obviously the biggest concern for this nascent network was making sure that all the nodes could talk even when they're using different, different software or bridging different protocols. But the internet of today, 2010, is a lot different than it was 40 years ago. Um, we have people giving their credit card numbers out over the internet. We have large amounts of certain countries' economies being dependent on internet sales. We have people actually concerned about security for their online email accounts. And I'm sure you're all quite aware that security has become a much bigger issue than it was when uh, ARPANET was a toy project run by a couple of academic institutions and the government. Um, so the real question that we need to answer is, is it even possible to uh, to, to secure all of these moving parts interacting at the same time. In order to discuss this, we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to fall back on a fairly classic model um, that anybody with a humanities background may actually be familiar with. Though usually Alice and Bob aren't the examples, but everybody knows Alice and Bob. They're famous. Um, so we've got four items here. We have the thought that Alice thinks. Then we have the translation of that thought into what she says. We have what Bob hears her saying, and then how Bob understands it. Now, if you look at that, you can see that there's, at every transition point, there's the potential for, uh, for corruption of the information. Everyone's familiar with the old telephone game um, that highlights the problem that cascading errors can cause, but those errors start immediately inside Alice's head. This is analogous to the way computers talk. We've got the actual data, and then how it is encoded for delivery over the network. There can be corruption there. The recipient machine hears it, parses it, and then turns it into data that it's going to use itself. Now, the two occurrences of data in this, I need a laser pointer. Uh, the two occurrences of data in this, uh, this slide here correspond to the, the thoughts that the individuals in our previous example in the linguistics model have. And clearly, they should be identical. Um, in practice, that's often not the case. The, uh, the biggest problem we're going to look at is right in here, where our machine Alice is saying something, and our machine Bob is parsing it, hearing it. That's where you're going to find your biggest potential for confusing Bob's idea of the data from what it originally was. All right, so when you have a serialization format, 
usually someone has actually written down what that's supposed to look like. Most RFCs are actually going to go so far as to, as to have a nice BNF definition sitting in the back so that really all you have to do is just translate, is translate that into, into whatever programming language you're using. But this is not necessarily the case. If you've ever taken a look at the specification for ASN1, for ECMAScript, or God help us all, HTML5, you will find a disturbing amount. That section over there has been reserved for the, uh, the auditors of ASN1, but it seems they've all killed themselves. So. <laughs> You will find a disturbing amount of information that is provided only in English, which means that the implementer has to figure out what they mean by this. A lot of, um, a lot of stuff is actually underspecified as well. And we also see in practice that implementations tend to vary from what the specification says whenever the implementer finds it quote unquote necessary, which sometimes means when it's convenient. Or when the implementer's boss finds it economically important or a business case. If you don't believe me, um, take a look at uh, MAN7 TCP on any Linux box. Um, you, will specifically see, you, will, you will see where it specifically says that it violates the RFC 1122 standard. Not to pick on Linux, this happens all over the place. At least they documented it. All right. so. Three rules that I want everybody to remember. If, this, if these are the only things you take away from this talk, you're doing better than most everybody out there. First and foremost, if your specification contains a grammar and your code does not directly implement that grammar, your implementation is wrong. Even before that, though, if your protocol can be modeled as a language, but your specification does not have a formal grammar for that language, your specification is already wrong. If there is ambiguity in your specification, there is going to be ambiguity in, in your implementation. Which means different dialects of implementation. When you leave it up to implementer discretion, that consigns yourself to having different implementations which will behave discreetly different. So last year, Len and Dan Kuminski gave a presentation here on a number of zero days that we discovered over the course of about a month in X509. Um, one, one fairly straightforward example, um, if you have a certificate authority that uses OpenSSL for handling certificate signing requests and a web browser that you know, uses crypto, Microsoft's crypto API for handling the certificates that come out of that, such as, say, Internet Explorer, you could have this situation occur. An attacker presents a certificate to the certificate authority, or uh, I'm sorry, a CSR to the certificate authority with this really wacky looking sequence that has not, it's not 2.5.4 dot very large number. It's actually 2.5.4.2 to the 64th plus one. As the OID. As the OI, uh, well, as an OID. That's, but the, oh, well, that's not actually an OID because 2.5. Oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, you're right. That, as an OID, my bad. 2.5.4.3 is common name. So, you know, 2.5.4. Large number is some random, some random OID that doesn't actually mean anything, and that's associated with www.paypal.com. Well, so the problem is OpenSSL hears it as a string literal that doesn't match CN, so it's safe. They don't have to. They don't have to check and make sure that its value matches anything. There's actually no logic for that. Uh, that's why it gets signed. Similar attack we found had to do with, uh, with null termination. Uh, you could have www.paypal.com, null character, dot your domain dot com. Open SSL once again, just takes that blob, checks it. It's a third, fourth, fifth level domain off of the domain that you own, so it'll sign it. Then the browsers go and parse it, and they hear something different. With the, with the null attack, which is not the slides, but uh, they parse it as www.paypal.com. Oh, there's a null character here, let's stop. Now, of course, they verify the signature first, and it's a valid signature over the opaque blob of data in it. And then when it's read, they do inside the browser a comparison to the, uh, the common name string for what your URL is supposed to be and what's in the URL Chrome box. And, they match. Whoops. So in the case of Internet Explorer, Crypto API actually does that math. And at least last year, um, 
Why? They were only using 64. They were using. They were only using 64-bit longs, which meant that uh, that uh, to uh, the, which meant that. I'm sorry. That sh that should say two to the 64 plus three. I don't know the, why, why that that port of here. Anyway, that's that's supposed to. Anyway, the math the math overflows and resolves to three, and IE says, "Oh, hey, that's a common name. PayPal.com. Great. This is a secure session." Why do you need to actually be doing mathematical calculations that require a big num library? over a string literal in the first place, baits the fuck out of me. If there's anybody in here from the Internet Explorer team, oh, they're all leaving. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd like an explanation for that. But it's, this particular instance has been fixed along with the seven other or so bugs that we found last year. But the question is, what, how did we find all of these all of a sudden? What's our, what's our magic? Well, we're getting to that. All right, so if you have two implementations of the same protocol, but they vary slightly, what you end up with is dialects that are, for the most part, mutually intelligible. This is kind of like Swedish and Norwegian. Unfortunately, the prob problems arise in the parts where they're, no, where they're not mutually intelligible, and you end up with ambiguous, interpre you end up with ambiguous interpretations. In, in the ideal world, and because of the fact that everything should be specified in a machine readable fashion in the first place, serialization and parsing ought to be the inverse of one another. The reason why this is important is because if you have two context-free grammars um, or anything stronger than that, um, it is not possible to determine whether they produce the exact same language Unless they, uh, unless, they, uh, unless they have the exact same set of symbols, rules, and transition functions. I'll get into what those are in just a minute. Um, with regular languages, which is to say regular expressions, uh, finite state machines, um, you, can, you can determine the equivalence of those. But for anything stronger than a regular expression, that problem is undecidable. So let's talk for a moment about the classes of formal languages. This is, this is known as the Chomsky hierarchy. So we've got regular, uh, regular languages, which are equivalent to regular expressions and finite state machines. These are all the same thing. The context-free languages are the same as push-down automata, which is basically uh, a, a single-stack automaton. Uh, con the context-sensitive languages have linear bounded automata as their mechanism, and then the recursive languages map to Turing machines. Um, so for any language, you'll have an input alphabet, some set of states, some set of transition functions, and an, out and an output alphabet. This is what formally defines a language. Okay, so what do we mean by regular languages? These are, as I said, the weakest class. And at, their, at, at the core, you're parsing input one token at a time, and those inputs cause transitions between discrete states. So um, if you have the regular expression AB star, then that's AB, 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 any number of repetitions of that. So I'm going to steal your cane. It can be zero or more repetitions. So it can go from start to success without, actually, without, without any input actually happening. Or it can be one repetition. So we go A, B, nothing more, we're done. It can be two repetitions. A, B, A, B, and we're done. You see, you see how it loops. If we see anything else, then, it'll go to the, then this will go to the dump state. Um, and, the, and, and the string is not recognized. This is the best language to implement protocols in if you can get away with it. It's the simplest to parse, simplest to show correctness, uh, but sometimes you need something a little more powerful than this. We'll, we'll be talking in a moment about situations where, you might, uh, situations where you might need a stronger class of grammars and, in fact, what class most protocols fall into. All right, so the next step up is the context-free languages. With the context-free languages, you get recursion. It's not actually possible to produce a finite state machine that generates A to the N, B to the N, which is to say a string with the same number of A's and followed by the same number, some number of A's followed by the same 